Um, Kelsey, thank you too. Thank you to Liz um, and to Humanities Texas. And most of all, thank you uh, teachers for, um, for having me uh, talk to you about the, the age of Jackson. Um, we'll be getting back to this burning building uh, by the end of the presentation. Um, there are many ways to define uh, the age of Jackson. I'm gonna be focusing in on two decades, the 1820s and 1830s, uh, the time when uh, Andrew Jackson rose to political prominence and power as a presidential candidate and then as president for eight years. Um, historians have used two labels to define uh, this period, the market revolution and Jacksonian democracy. Uh, again, referencing Jackson's name uh, to help us understand, uh, understand the, the economic and the political transformations uh, of this period. Um, but those labels, I, I think sometimes um, give us a, a, a false sense of kind of broad agreement within society about, um, about these political and economic transformations. So on the one hand, I want in this presentation to define what those economic and political transformations uh, were, uh, but also to help you and your students appreciate that what we should really focus in on is how Americans uh, debated uh, economic and political transformations that were happening in the 1820s and 30s. Um, to ask questions about um, whether the market revolution uh, provided uh, economic opportunity to Americans, and if so, for whom? Um, how did Jacksonian uh, democracy as a label, how does that define um, uh, politics and democratic political culture? Did it provide uh, a citizenship to Americans and for whom? Um, I also want to contend, and I, I'll try to show this over the course of, of the presentation, uh, that whenever uh, um, Americans talked about um, economic opportunity and political citizenship, they most often um, came back to the issues of slavery and race. Those were always central uh, uh, issues and, and institutions when they talked about uh, economic opportunity and, uh, and political rights. All right, so we'll, we'll get back. Certainly you, you might, if you've, if you've seen the sources that I shared, you will, you will notice this, this image of the county election, the, the, the um, painting by George Caleb Bingham uh, that um, uh, was he, he painted in the 1850s a little bit after this period. And uh, that image of the Erie Canal uh, on, on the left, a, a, a transportation infrastructure project uh, funded by the state of New York that um, connected the New York City to the Great Lakes region and made for the, the speedier flow of goods and people um, across space and, and certainly uh, not only shortened travel, but cheapened it. We'll talk about that as a, as a crucial economic development over the course of our time together tonight. In the early Republic, citizens were landholders and household heads. Um, they were virtuous and incorruptible, it was thought, according to the political ideology of the early republic, because they owned property. Um, uh, the, these household heads were ruling and protecting dependent people in their households. Um, the irony is that to expand liberty to the next generation, um, the American Republic uh, needed to become an empire. In Jefferson's phrase, it had to become an empire for liberty. Um, and the crucial figure, I think, among others in creating that empire for liberty in what became the, the Southwest in the 1820s and 30s, um, the, the Gulf South, um, the instrumental figure was Andrew Jackson. Um, Andrew Jackson's exploits uh, to establish uh, US sovereignty over uh, what had been British and Native American territories uh, was accomplished uh, through violence. Um, during war, he um, uh, um, pitted two factions of the Creeks in Alabama against one another, um, signed uh, and negotiated and signed a, a fraudulent treaty with one faction and took millions of acres of land. Um, 
uh, he um, fought the climactic battle of the of the War of 1812 at New Orleans, uh, stopping uh, the 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 British Army's advance there. Uh, after the War of 1812, he um, uh, fought the Seminole uh, uh, Nation in Florida, and during his presidency, he. Um, initiated, uh, along with allies in Congress, a, a program uh, that was called Indian Removal. Um, uh, those, those exploits in uh, dispossessing and then deporting uh, Native Americans west of the Mississippi uh, created, uh, uh, opened up uh, territory for white American men uh, to move there by land from a national land office and um, fully integrate the United States into a transatlantic economy in cotton, which became the largest export uh, of the United States during these decades that I'm, uh, I'm referring to. Um, this individualistic scramble for land uh, slaves and uh, profit in the Southwest embodied and it was at the heart of uh, the nation's economic transformation, this market revolution uh, that I mentioned before, that, that integrated the US into this transatlantic economy in cotton, uh, that was, um, that, uh, you know, really uh, was funded by uh, white Americans' control over the labor of enslaved people who would harvest that, that cotton. Uh, the access to credit and cap capital from banks because slave owners uh, owned human commodities they could use as collateral to get loans. And then the, the capital running through the system enriched not only Southern slave owners and slave traders, um, but also New York financiers and shipping magnets um, and New England and England's uh, textile manufacturers. So um, as, as um, anti-slavery um, thinkers and, and politicians would often say, uh, slavery was uh, part and parcel of the nation's economy. And so there was a lot of blame to go around. Everybody was, was implicated in the system uh, at which slavery was, um, was at the heart. And this, uh, this, this image here is of a, of a steamboat, uh, a technological advance uh, of the period representative of the technological advances at the heart of the market revolution, laden with bales of cotton transported from the Gulf South uh, out in the Gulf of Mexico up to New York, where it was shipped uh, to English ports like Liverpool um, and to textile manufacturers in New England in places like Lowell. The, the individualistic and competitive economy had its ups and downs, its booms and busts. At the heart of this, this new economy, an anonymous economy in a world of strangers was trust. Could you trust the people uh, that you were dealing with? You were no longer dealing economically just with your neighbors. You were dealing with people you didn't know. Could you trust them? Um, could you trust the value of, of banknotes? The, the money that you held in your pocket. An exercise I like to, uh, to do with my students is to pull out a $20 bill with Jackson's face on it and ask my students why uh, that bill is worth $20. And it leads to an interesting discussion about uh, fiat currency and legal tender and moving off of a gold standard and um, uh, the, the importance of a nation's ability to pay off its debts as being crucial to uh, assessing the value of its currency. But it also introduces students to um, the, eco the economic world of the 1820s and 30s when there were literally hundreds of banks all printing uh, paper notes that promised if the holder of a note brought that bill to the bank that they would be reimbursed at face value in gold or silver, hard money um, that had value. So um, people of the 1820s and 1830s not only had to read strangers, whether they could trust them, whether they could have confidence in them, but they had to read their money. They had to determine whether notes were counterfeit or genuine. Um, they, had to, um, they had to determine whether distant banks were solvent, whether they, they could um, uh, pay, um, pay a, a, a note holder in gold or silver. Uh, this made um, economic dealing uh, quite daunting and risky. 
um, and wearying, even if the economy seemed to promise um, lots of opportunities for advancement and opportunities to get rich and get rich quick. Um, when everybody had trust, uh, there were flush times when everybody would be able uh, to get uh, credit and capital from banks. But when people started to lose trust, uh, there was constricting credit and panics, as you see here in this image, when all note holders tried to run on the bank at the same time to get as much gold and silver as they could uh, to recoup uh, their, their notes. Um, in the, uh, what followed when banks closed their doors was hard times, the opposite of flush times. Uh, that is to say, uh, times in which businesses failed, in which there was widespread unemployment. In the panic of 1837, for instance, um, southern banks and southern states in particular defaulted. Um, they couldn't pay their debts, um, mainly due to the, to the rapid expansion of the cotton economy, which seemed to promise great riches to the men who got involved in it. Um, people needing credit and capital to buy uh, slaves and land as fast as they could to make profits from them. Um, but when those banks and uh, southern states defaulted, um, they were in default uh, mainly uh, to northern creditors, and that created a regional conflict uh, between uh, the two halves of the nation. Um, the, the people who suffered the most uh, from the Panic of 1837, though, were um, enslaved people. Um, the way in which uh, white men tried to pay off their bad bets was by selling the enslaved people who they had, who they had purchased. And that often meant the breakup of enslaved uh, people's families. And that um, produced great conflict um, when we'll talk about um, northern abolitionists um, in, in a little bit. The political transformation that we call democracy, and again, we're going to talk about this image uh, a, little, a little later, um, emerged out of egalitarian ideologies of the early republic coming out of the revolution, but also a great concern that property ownership uh, alone uh, couldn't be the basis of voting rights. Uh, most every state constitution had property qualifications to vote um, because property holding was meant, uh, supposedly gave citizens civic virtue. They couldn't be corrupted by employers or, um, or landlords to tell them how to vote. Um, but in an era of market competition, um, men couldn't be sure that they would, they would have enough property to qualify. This was also an era of emancipation in the northern states, and it was galling to a lot of white northerners when bl black property holders were able in several northern states uh, to vote on the basis of their property. So in state after state, with a few exceptions, um, we see uh, northerners in particular um, uh, rewriting state constitutions, getting rid of the property uh, requirement for voting, and um, adding a clause that stated that all all adult white men could vote. So uh, this process that historians have labeled universal white manhood suffrage was of course universal for only for adult white men. Uh, it, did, it did create a, a, a race and gender expectations of, of who, uh, who could vote and who could uh, therefore um, have those particular citizenship rights. Those aren't the only rights of citizens, as we can talk about later, um, but this is the, the, maybe, the, maybe the clearest one. Um, and so uh, this, this idea that it's universal, though, we have to unpack, and we can do that in the discussion of this, of this image. That uh, this process of, of universal white manhood suffrage uh, shaped the boisterous political culture of the period. It heightened partis partisanship between uh, Andrew Jackson's Democratic Party and uh, their challengers, the Whigs, led by Henry Clay of Kentucky. Um, uh, the Whigs were called the Whigs. It was hearkening back to an 18th century English political party that um, uh, saw itself as being opposed to the, the privileges of, of the monarchy. And so Clay and the Whigs in America are clearly trying to say that Andrew Jackson is the dangerous uh, autocrat, the demagogue uh, that the founders warned us about. And he, um, he should be uh, uh, um, certainly have his power constricted where it could be. 
But these parties disagreed with each other about uh, the market revolution and particularly about the role of, of the government in shaping uh, economic transformation. Um, Henry Clay had a three-pronged economic plan he called the American system. He thought that um, each region of the country uh, played uh, kind of uh, were parts of a symbiotic whole, uh, whereby um, each region produced and consumed different products uh, and thus uh, uh, created the circumstances in which all Americans could prosper economically. Um, but Clay wanted the government, uh, the federal government, to play a really important role in economic development. So he, he wanted federal funding for infrastructure projects uh, uh, like the Erie Canal, but it extended on an, on a, on a, on an interstate scale. Um, he wanted a strong national bank that would manage the economy, manage this, this um, system in which there were hundreds of other banks, um, constricting capital uh, credit uh, and loans when it had to, and um, loosening the, the reins on, on credit when it, when it could, uh, to maybe um, kind of even out the ebbs and flows of this, of this boom and bust economy. Um, he also wanted a, a high tax a tariff. Uh, placed upon European imports uh, as a as a means of of grow helping to grow a um, uh, a nascent industrial sector in the American Northeast. Um, he believed that his policies were uh, the essence of democracy in an in an economic context. He believed that his policies would create opportunity uh, for many Americans. And in fact, he he um, he fought against Jackson's assertions that the American uh, system tended to create economic inequality or aristocracy in America. He said that any factory owner that he knew back in Kentucky were men uh, who were um, uh, uh, self-made. They were enterprising and self-made men. In fact, he and his, uh, his kind of um, his campaign managers, uh, Henry Clay's campaign managers, seem to have coined this phrase, uh, self-made men. And they were self-made because they, they had acquired wealth, he said, uh, through their, patient, their own patient and diligent labor. They hadn't uh, been given anything. They had done things by, done, uh, they had advanced themselves by their own hard work. And by defining success in that way through one's character, um, what Clay is also doing is implicitly defining why men fail. That is not something about the, econ the economic structure of the nation or the transatlantic economy itself. It's something having to do with a failure in the man. Um, Jackson uh, fought back against Clay's uh, American system, uh, again, saying that um, uh, that institutions like the National Bank, which Clay supported, uh, created aristocracy. Um, the role of the government in in um, in supporting a national bank created artificial distinctions in society. They made the rich richer and the potent more powerful. Jackson said, and so he thought that the the quote unquote humble members of society, the farmers, the mechanics, the laborers, uh, who aren't able to kind of um, to work uh, government in their uh, and shape it in their own favor to do its bidding, um, could feel a real injustice. And in that, Jackson um, had uh, ordinary people, working class people, who, who agreed with him. Um, I know you've talked about uh, the Lowell Mill Girls a little bit last week. Um, these were young women who uh, left their, their families' farms uh, in New England uh, to live uh, independently in, um, in manufacturing villages, um, spinning and weaving on large looms, um, the, the raw materials sent them that had been harvested uh, by the work of enslaved laborers in the South. So these, these young women are part of this transatlantic cotton economy. In some ways, you could see what they're doing as, as liberating to them. And in fact, when they did go out on strike, Lowell Mill Girls who were protesting um, diminishing wages, uh, longer work hours, and a speed-up system 
that uh, in which employers over the course of the 1830s tried to tried to increase production, um, they would call themselves independent daughters of free men. Uh, that is to say, to speak to their their own independence and the the kind of grounding that that statement about political independence uh, in their own hard work. So in some ways, they're buying in uh, to what Clay has to say about hard work. Um, but in calling themselves independent daughters of free men, uh, we're all uh, contemporaries were often uh, questioning. Um, how free their fathers could be if they had to send their daughters to work uh, in textile mills. Uh, that does suggest some, word, some downward mobility for families. There's also um, a, a, a subtext of racism in the Lowell Mill Girls' attempts to conceive of what was wrong with wage labor. Um, in one song they sang during, a, during one strike, um, uh, they sang the lyrics, oh, isn't it a pity such a pretty girl as I should be sent to the factory to pine away and die? Oh, I cannot be a slave. I will not be a slave for I'm so fond of liberty that I cannot be a slave. The, the most degrading thing they could think of um, to explain how they were feeling about their own work, work conditions and experience was to compare themselves uh, to enslaved people and to suggest um, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty baldly uh, that their that their position was lower than that of ins of enslaved African Americans and in this in this racist society that was a uh, that was a really stark uh, stark claim to make slaveholders themselves felt threatened by uh, the new political culture and the new politics uh, the majoritarian democracy of their day um, they worried about uh, the effects of Clay's high tariff on their ability to sell cotton to English textile manufacturers if uh, Americans weren't going to buy as many English manufactured goods because the tariff uh, steered them toward uh, uh, North American uh, U.S. alternatives. Um, that, that concern about uh, uh, economics and the fact that it was passed by a majority supporting it um, suggested to some slaveholders like John C. Calhoun of South Carolina that uh, there have to, had, had to be kind of a repackaging of the American political system to protect the rights of, of minorities. Here he's thinking of uh, the interest of slaveholders themselves. Uh, and he argued uh, that they ought to have some sort of veto power on the legislation passed uh, by, uh, by legislative majorities. And the way he talked about doing that was to propose a, um, a, a, a system whereby Southern states could uh, enact an ordinance of nullification, declaring null and, and void federal legislation that was offensive to the interests of people living in that state. Um, that was, in his mind, the best way to protect Republican liberty and the rights to property that were enshrined in, in that ideology. Of course, there were opponents who uh, saw nullification as, as a grave uh, threat uh, to the Union and to uh, the, 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 the system of democracy as it, as it existed. Um, uh, Daniel Webster, a senator from Massachusetts, argued that what Calhoun and other Southerners were saying was that they wanted liberty first and union afterwards. Um, he thought that was a delusional ideology. And he said in a, in a speech that a lot of Northern school children memorized, uh, he said that liberty and union now and forever were one and inseparable. You could not pull these things apart. The fear here was that in 1832, South Carolina uh, took Calhoun up on his, uh, on his idea and nullified uh, the tariff said that customs revenue could not be collected um, in uh, the port of Charleston. Uh, Congress responded and President Jackson responded uh, with legislation that allowed President Jackson 
uh, to, to use the armed forces to collect the customs. At the same time that they did that, um, Congress agreed to lower the tariff and allow South Carolina to pull back its, or its ordinance and save face. But you see here that even within uh, discussions about uh, economic legislation, that it does tend uh, to come back to concerns um, from slaveholders about their rights to property and how those would be protected later on. And you can you can talk about nullification as historians have done as a prelude uh, to secession and and to civil war. Slave owners had to deal with a threat from within. Um, that is to say that enslaved people resisted their enslavement, sometimes through day to day kind of covert uh, resistance, breaking tools, running away, but sometimes uh, dramatically in overt resistance. Uh, one of those instances occurred in Southampton County, Virginia in 1831, when an enslaved man named Nat Turner led uh, a group of enslaved uh, men and women in a rebellion against slavery, killing some 55 people in their county. You can see by this image, a pro-slavery image, um, it, that um, you can see what the, the fear was that enslaved, uh, enslaved rebels would kill white men, leaving white women and children um, uh, um, at, their, at their disposal. And you see the, the quote unquote heroics of a white Virginia militia to um, capture uh, these rebels and then to execute them. Um, slave owners could not believe that, uh, that African-American slaves uh, would do anything like this of their own, own volition and accord. Um, uh, they believed that enslaved people were generally happy with their condition and cared for by paternalistic um, owners. Um, so they, they blamed outsiders, namely a new group of radical abolitionists in the North who went beyond an earlier form of anti-slavery that stressed gradual uh, emancipation and the colonization of former slaves outside of the United States and focused on the immediate abolition of slavery and the conferral of, of social and political equality to former slaves in American society. Those were radical ideas. Um, but, the, but abolitionists would not accept blame for Nat Turner's rebellion. Uh, one of uh, the, the main uh, sources of, of radical abolitionism in the North was a, a Boston newspaper called The Liberator. And their response to these accusations was, quote, the slaves need no incentives at our hands. They will find them in their stripes in their emaciated bodies, in their ceaseless toil, in every field, in every valley, on every hilltop and mountain, wherever you and your fathers have fought for liberty. This is a, a, a statement that really encapsulates both the, the fact that slavery and the violence of slavery is at the heart of the market revolution that's, that's unfolding in the South and the nation as, as a whole. The liberator thought slavery a national crime, uh, that Northerners were benefiting from it too. Uh, but they also point to the hypocrisy of Southern slaveholders' um, uh, uh, um, uh, um, use of uh, control over and exploitation of African Americans' labor um, and uh, uh, basically calling out their hypocrisy um, given that their forefathers had fought for liberty during the revolution. This other image on this slide is an anti-abolitionist image uh, that circulated around the North. It was, it was published in New York City, proving that anti-abolitionism was as much a Northern as a Southern phenomenon. And, and the, the idea here in an amalgamation waltz is that uh, abolitionists are also hypocrites, that what they say they want is for equal political and social rights, but that's really a Trojan horse uh, for um, what they really want, which is the mixing of the races, a, a sexual liberty for African-American men uh, to, to court and marry white women. That's the, that's the racist, um, uh, not subtext, but text of, of anti-abolitionism in the North. Abolitionists tried to petition Congress uh, to end slavery where they thought they could. That wasn't in Southern states. 
Um, uh, the Constitution protects slavery where it exists. Um, but the, the Constitution also gives an opportunity to, uh, uh, for, for those who, of this mind uh, to attack slavery in the Western territories or in the District of Columbia where, um, where Congress is in control. And a lot of these petitions coming in to uh, congressmen like John Quincy Adams of Massachusetts, who served his constituency outside of, outside of Boston for some two decades after he was president. He was the only president uh, to serve in Congress after, after he was president. Um, uh, they were petitions coming from um, uh, abolitionists and a lot of them women who um, who argued uh, advocated for the uh, the end of the slave trade in the District of Columbia, saying that um, uh, that um, it wasn't right for congressmen to look out their windows down Capitol Hill and see human beings auctioned off for the highest price. Um, quickly, Southerners and Northern al allies came together and decided that all of these petitions should be tabled. That is not read. And uh, that gave Adams and other, uh, other anti-slavery representatives an opportunity uh, to fight not only against slavery, but against the infringement on the political rights of Northern citizens. Um, they would argue uh, in the 1830s until the gag rule was suspended in, in 1844 and beyond that there was a slave power in Washington that conspired against the liberties of white Northerners. Um, when uh, uh, it, it's, it's telling, I think, uh, that the critics uh, of Adams often talked about the ways in which uh, the women who made these petitions ought to um, remove themselves from the political sphere um, go back to cooking dinners and darning their stockings. These women were supposed to be dependent on men uh, in households, uh, but their prominence in these debates helps reveal what the economic and political transformations of the time had done and um, uh, shows us how, um, how white men in particular responded in violence uh, to, uh, to their presence in the political world. So this is where I'm gonna end. Uh, the debates about slavery and citizenship as they were unfolding in a Northern city, Philadelphia, in a May uh, of 1838, with the construction of this building, Pennsylvania Hall, a couple blocks north of Independence Hall, the birthplace of American liberty, where the continent, members of the Continental Congress had signed the Declaration of Independence. This was a building constructed um, by and for abolitionists with small donations coming in from all over the country. Um, they knew uh, they couldn't. Uh, they couldn't have rights to free speech and petition in Congress. They needed a space to speak their mind. Um, this building opened in on May fifteenth, eighteen thirty-eight. The first event uh, that happened in this hall was the abolitionist marriage of the century between Theodore Dwight Weld and Angelina Grimke, a stalwart members of the abolitionist movement who, in print and speech had, um, had laid out for the American public, the people who wanted to listen anyway, of the horrors of slavery and the slave trade. The uh, wedding cake was made by an African-American confectioner and he made it out of sugar uh, harvested by wage labor, not slave labor, making a political point about the need uh, to consume properly if you're, if you're anti-slavery. You don't wanna buy uh, slave produced goods. That was the, the inaugural event in Pennsylvania Hall. The next night, uh, there was no honeymoon for Angelina Grimke, now Angelina Grimke Weld. Uh, she didn't um, uh, shrink into the background as a married woman. Uh, she joined other women as part of an anti-slavery convention of American women meeting in this hall. Um, a crowd of hundreds of white men uh, not in any way sympathetic to abolitionism, emerged and, and surrounded the hall, um, peering in the windows to see these women in the parlance of the time unsex themselves. That is to act like men in a public political way. 
They started to throw rocks at the building, breaking some of them. They were uh, yelling uh, um, scurrilous epithets at these ladies, and some were cowering in their seats and maybe uh, wanting the meeting to end. And Angelina Grimke Weld got up to the podium and, and asked them this question. What if the mob should now burst in upon us, break up our meeting, and commit violence against our persons? That's, of course, what they're all afraid of. But she um, quickly galvanized them with another question. Would this be anything compared to what the slaves endure? That really brought, uh, brought them together around this common purpose. They wouldn't end their meeting. They wouldn't be cowed into silence by the crowd. Uh, they left with their heads held high, and they left arm in arm with white and black men uh, who were in the audience. Um, they passed out of the hall through this angry crowd, um, but that kind of inner, inner, um, uh, that holding arms, arm in arms between white women and black men was exactly what uh, anti-abolitionists feared the most, and that's what brought them back uh, to the hall the next night um, in greater numbers, uh, much more violently, violently, violently disposed. This led Philadelphia's mayor uh, to bar the abolitionists from entering the hall to give further speeches. Um, he told the crowd to go home and go to sleep like he was going to do, and he left, and they did this. Burned the building to the ground. The, um, the fire companies that came, you can see here, are, are uh, attending to buildings nearby to make sure they don't, they don't burn down. So when we talk about democracy in America, well, when we talk about economic transfer, transformation and, and democratic transformation, I want you to think about um, this being representative of democracy in America too. The struggles, the contest uh, between, between Americans over rights uh, uh, and uh, access to, to economic opportunity. Uh, so I will stop there. Uh, I look forward to, uh, to the, to the Q&A and to uh, our discussion.